Hello viewers, welcome to Andy Analysis. Welcome back everyone. So at the end of the last video I decided that I will change my approach a little bit and focus on those moments in the piece that sound like jazz or rather that use colors or writing techniques that could also be used in a jazz piece. I chose this over a meticulous analysis of the entire piece, bar by bar, because that would a take a very long time and b is not even really what I want to do. So without further ado, let's continue. A few bars down the road from where we left off last time, the piece hits us with its full force for the first time. In the spirit of program music, this is where the sad evening crushes us with its power. It is but one of the moments in this piece that just completely destroy me. Definitely listen to a recording of this. Listen to the entire thing from start to finish. The music will tell you a lot more than I ever could. Again, it is very noticeable how the writing is thought in multiple layers. We got some bitonality going on again. Leaving the trombones out in the first bar, I'll get to them in a sec, we can see that the brass instrument are in some kind of F dominant flat 9 environment. While the strings are divided in an F major with a flat 9 on top and a G sharp major chord in the bottom. This chord is actually as jazz as it gets. I took the liberty to respell it as F and A flat instead of E sharp and G sharp. And what becomes easily visible now is that this polychord that I called F major flat 9 over A flat before should actually better be named F major over A flat 7. An even better way to name this chord, the jazz way, would actually be A flat 13 flat 9, making clear that in the end it's one sound. This concept of putting a triad on top of a basic chord, to spice things up if you will, is fittingly referred to as an upper structure triad. And again, this is a very common way of writing chords in a jazz orchestra, to give all the basic notes to the trombones and then put the upper structure in the trumpets. The common scale jazz players would use to improvise over this A flat 13 flat 9 chord would be A flat half tone whole tone. As it contains all the mentioned chord tones, as well as all the mentioned tensions. Those fast notes in the strings will of course be perceived as something like a wave of sound later, almost glissando-like, rather than individual notes. It's an additional texture supporting the chosen colors of Lily's sound painting, because surprise, surprise, if you actually do look closer at those notes, they turn out to be coming from the exact scale I mentioned. Hey hey, it's Meta Andy again. I just wanted to point out quickly that this is one of the many spots in the piece where I thought Lily was probably a bit ahead of her time. Of course, symmetric scales uh, had been used at that time already, especially by French composers, but um, I thought they were more typically associated with more modern composers, um, especially of course Messiaen. This might of course also just be me being misinformed. If you know better, let me know, but uh, try to keep the feedback constructive. Back to you, Andy. Thank you, Meta Andy. Now let's talk about those trombones. Do you see how all those lines are descending chromatically? In jazz arranging, the standard way to voice a note that approaches a target note chromatically is by using the exact same voicing as the target, starting either a half tone higher or lower, depending on the line so that every voice can resolve chromatically. This is called a chromatic approach. If you do it twice, it's called a double chromatic approach. So I'm gonna go ahead and call this one a quintuple chromatic approach. Seriously though, the concept is, once again, parallelism. Quite similar to the beginning, but this time in a chromatic context. So again we are starting with one type of chord or voicing and since the lower voices follow the lead voice the result is this minor major going down chromatically. In fact I would like to show you two more examples of this kind of writing for brass that I found. The first one is at the beginning of the middle section. 
The timpani is playing this marching triplet based rhythm. In fact, the tempo indication for this section is funèbre, so it is basically a funeral march. The bass is playing a pedal again, this time C. On top of this, the French horns are playing something like a signal, which is echoed by the trumpets and trombones playing with mutes two bars later. Also here, I found the choice of notes rather interesting. Lily used a half diminished color. Half diminished would normally function as a suspended chord that resolves to a dominant chord. But again, Lily didn't use the chords in a functional harmony context, but rather stand alone as a color. Of course, harmony is not the only way to color the piece. And here, I'm finally giving in, and I will talk about orchestration. In writing slash arranging slash orchestrating, there's a rule saying that you shouldn't write certain intervals too low. For each interval, there's a so-called low interval limit. It is advisable not to write lower than that, or else there's the danger of the sound becoming muddy and undefined. However, Lily was a master of orchestration, and she consciously wrote the brass extremely low here. It is indeed the brassy quality of the instruments that allows this. Having more bright overtones than other instruments, the notes still shine even in a low register. This is especially true when you're using a mute, which cuts away a lot of the low end and thus brings out even more of that sharp, brassy, snaring sound. This low brass writing was actually very popular in late romantic music. Just think of Wagner, who had a whole new instrument built to make better use of that effect. I just love the sound of this or in fact the sound of low brass in general, which maybe has to do with its register being very close to that of my voice, and then also for another, more personal reason. One more example, also very much following the same idea. Let's leave the brass for now and look at another spot where the concept of writing and colors is very visible. For orientation, we are at the second half of the midsection now. In this section, the color changes in a two bar pattern. It is starting off with C, whole tone, half tone, the significant other of the formerly mentioned half tone, whole tone scale, the whole tone, half tone scale, or diminished scale, as it is made up of two intertwined dim 7 chords, has a very dark, almost eerie sound when played standalone. The next color is A melodic minor. To me, A minor feels very calm and sort of neutral by itself already. Now adding two more sharps to make it A melodic minor, I would definitely call this a brighter color compared to the whole tone half tone. Next is whole tone half tone again, and again followed by A. This time I called it Dorian um, because there was no G sharp. This darker versus brighter color kind of idea continues for the whole section. Just playing it to you will make clear what I mean. And then, a little further into the section, suddenly this happens. Alright, give me the blues, Lily. Je suis une compositrice française. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, this is getting silly. I agree, silly, silly, silly. Let's just call it a video for now and uh, 
Hope to see you all on the next. Bye.